spend a lot of time talking to you about the extended verb ending with the ETH and how um, and how that was used by the, the Bishop's Bible translators and how that, that actually goes all the way back to Wycliffe. Uh, we, we saw that last time. But the question came up about love charity. So one of the things that I did is I, I, I created this table that has every occurrence of charity. So we'll go down here and I just want to point this out to you. So charity occurs 28 times in 24 verses in the King James Bible. So the verses in this table are just those 28 occurrences, okay? Those 28 occurrences in 24 verses. So there's 24 verses that are listed here, all right? So I went all the way back. So the first occurrence is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And I want you to notice, what did Wycliffe have? Charity, Charity right? So Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, Great, Geneva, and the first edition of the bishops, they all had what? Love. Love, all right? Then we get to the Reims New Testament uh, in 15, 1582, and then we have the 1602 Bishop's Bible, which is the base text for the King James, and what does it have every time in these 28 occurrences? It has charity, right? So you can see what's going on here as, as you look, look at this. So uh, the word agape obviously occurs more than 28 times in the New Testament. The rest of the 28 times it's uh, the, the occurrences of agape beyond these 28 in the King James are rendered as love, but these 28 times it's charity. And you need to see that in those exact 28 times, the Bishop's Bible had already, in its second edition, changed that because in the first edition, what did they have? They had love in all 28 of those spots, right? And we see that Wycliffe used charity every time except for once there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and then two more times, once in 2 Timothy 3.10 and once in Titus 2.2. 2. Every other time he had what? No, every other time he had charity, right? And then we come over here to these other Bibles. So here we have the Reims. The Reims is using charity almost every time, except for once in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Or verse, yeah, verse 5. And then again in 2 Timothy. So notice that the Reims is very similar to Wycliffe and how Wycliffe did things back in the 1300s, okay? So I'm just showing you this to just kind of close the loop on this, that um, that issue that is, is debated quite heavily by King James advocates in our day is, um, I think there's some misconceptions about some of that stuff, okay? And some of, and, and some of that understanding that uh, folks have about that. But anyway, that's not the main point of today's lesson, so if you would, go to your notes. So, introduction. Last week in Lesson 143, we, con we conducted our seventh study related to the Bishop's Bible. Thus far, we have considered the following regarding this important edition. We looked at understanding the King James Connection in Lesson 137. So that's the understanding that the 1602 Bishop's Bible was the base text for the King James, and that they literally were editing a 1602 Bishop's Bible as they were conducting their process, that is the King James Translators. In 138, we looked at understanding the Elizabethan context. 139, we looked at understanding the scope and process of the project. In 140, lesson 140, we looked at the Old Testament. Lesson 141, we looked at the New Testament. Lesson 142, we looked at the contents and features of the Bishop's Bible. And then last time, we looked at the linguistic features in lesson 140. This morning, we're going to conclude our study of the Bishop's Bible by reviewing its later or latter history and discussing the impact of Miles Coverdale. As things stand right now, so as things stand right now where we are right now, sort of in this class, there is one more pre-1611 English Bible that requires our attention before we begin discussing the authorized version next fall. And that's the Reims New Testament of 1582. So we've, we've covered, so let's just kind of go back to this list just for the sake of uh, looking at this. We've talked about every single one of these Bibles. We've talked about Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, Great, Geneva, Bishops, okay? The, uh, we've talked about the different editions of the Bishops. The only one left that we have to talk about before we get to the King James is which one? Reams. The Reams, all right? And we've talked about this not just in a precurrent, not just sort of in a fly by the seat of your pants way. We've looked in detail at every one of these. 
and we've studied how the readings have, you know, I hate to use the word evolved because it has a negative connotation, but I'm going to use it in the sense that how the readings have what? Changed and progressed over time. Um, so we've done that. So there's only one left to talk about, which would be the reams, and we're going to start doing that next Sunday. Before commencing our discussion of the Reims New Testament, prudence dictates that I say a few words also about the death of Miles Coverdale. So let's look first at the, the, the first point, which is the latter history, and this would be the latter history of the bishops, the post-Parker fortunes of the bishop's Bible. Professor David Daniel, the author of The Bible in English, Its History and Influence, reports the following printing statistics for the bishop's Bible. Quote, the bishop's Bible was always a lavish production as a piece of bookmaking. So as a book, as the printing of a book goes, the Bishop's Bible was always a very uh, lavish production in terms of bookmaking, even in smaller size. There were 14 editions up to Parker's death in 1575 and a further 22 to 1611. So if you, if you take Parker's statistics there, you're going to end up with what? 14 plus 22 is how many? You guys that are math geniuses. 36. 36 printing. 36 editions of the Bishop's Bible between 1568 when it's first done and the printing of the King James in 1611. That'd be 36 editions during that time period according to Parker's rendering of an edition. Okay? So that's, not, that's quite a few in, in that space of time. So the Bishop's Bible is going to be printed fairly often and frequently during that time frame. Lawrence M. Vance, author of The Making of the King James Bible New Testament, that's 2015 when that was written, highlights the fact that the publication figures offered by Dr. Daniel in the above quote are not set in stone. On pages 25 through 27, Vance identified at least 24 different authors who wrote about the history, uh, that should say, of the English Bible. So we need to add of the English Bible. It's in the... Yeah, okay, it was added here. So I need to read off this, not this. That's right, I, I had a hard time downloading this for some reason. Uh, okay, let me start that over again. Sorry about that. Vance identified at least 24 authors who wrote about the history of the English Bible, all of whom provide different publication statistics for the Bishop's Bible. Meanwhile, Vance counts 18 different editions of the Bishop's Bible, the last of which was the folio published in 1602, according to his reckoning. Okay, so he says there's how many? What, so Daniel says there's 18, or sorry, 36. Vance says there's how many? 18 editions, right? So we got a discrepancy in the a number of editions here that are being discussed. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why that is here in a second. So one guy says 36, another guy says 18. And if you look at all 24 of these other guys, they're going to give you a different number. So this is a little bit confusing, and no, no one's exactly sure exactly how many editions of the Bishop's Bible there were. So here's what Vance says. Quote, there were 18 editions of the Bishop's Bible, and they were published from 1568 to 1602. Eleven were folios, so that's talking about the size of the Bibles. Seven were, now Sylvia, you corrected me once before about this word. What is, how do you say it? Quartos. quartos. Although one of the quartos is described by some as an octavo. So that's three different sizes of Bibles, Right? So when you hear, when you see those words, a folio, a, a quarto, or, or an octavo, it's talking about the different sizes, right? So let me try to illustrate that for you. This this is an old Schofield Bible. This is an old Schofield wide margin Bible. Are they the, are, is the information in both of these the same? The difference is the size of what? The, book. the Bible, right? And I have an old Schofield at home that's a pocket edition that's like this big. It's actually in my desk at school. It's like this big. So they're all old Schofield Bibles. They're just all three different what? 
sizes, right? So when you read language like the folio, the quarto, and the octavo, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that the Bibles are different what? Sizes, okay? So when it comes to those, when it comes to the editions of the Bishop's Bible, New Testament, it is difficult to determine just how many editions there were and when they were published, okay? Meanwhile, A.S. Herbert... Meanwhile, A.S. Herbert's historical catalog of printed editions of the English Bible, 1526 to 1916, contains entries for printings for a bishop's Bible in 1606, along with New Testaments in 1613, 1614, and 1617, beyond which I could find no entries. All things considered, it seems that these post-1602 printings were reprints of earlier editions, not entirely new what? Edition. So here's where we have to make a distinction between two things, okay? The first one is an edition. And the second is of a what? Of a reprint. Can you have a whole, can you have a new edition that has changes in it? That would be an edition, right? Versus a reprint of a previously printed what? Edition, right? So when we see these discrepancies, like 36 editions versus 18 editions, I believe that discrepancies are coming in by we're counting everything as a new edition, not necessarily as a reprint of a previous what? Edition. And I think that's why people get confused and fuzzy in the math, because they're not really zeroing in on is this a new edition or is this a reprint of a previous one? edition, right? So even this, this Schofield Bible, I got this Bible in 1999, um, and this is like the second, it's falling apart now, but this is a second edition of a Schofield. So this one was copyrighted in um, 1917, but has it been reprinted a bunch of different times? So this is a, this, it's not necessarily a new edition, but it's been reprinted a bunch of different times, right? So we understand the difference between, or we're trying to understand the difference between an edition and a what? And a reprint, okay? So I think the reason why you see statistical variance in these numbers is because of confusion over reprints versus editions, okay? So recall from Lesson 139 that Archbishop Parker never succeeded in securing an exclusive license or authorization from Queen Elizabeth for the Bishop's Bible. When the project was completed, Archbishop Parker presented a copy of the Bishop's Bible to Queen Elizabeth, along with dated letters to the Queen and her Secretary of State, William Cecil. Included within the material dated October 5th, 1568, that Parker sent to Cecil was a letter to Queen Elizabeth from the Archbishop. J.I. Mombert reproduced the letter as follows on page 270 of his 1883 book, English Versions of the Bible. So we're going to read, we've read this once before, we're going to check it out again. So here's what Archbishop Parker is saying to Queen Elizabeth about the Bishop's Bible. He says, Among diverse observations, we have been regarded in this recognition, uh, one was, to make it very much from the translation which was commonly used by the public order, except where either the verity of the Hebrew and Greek moved alteration, or where the text was by some negligence mutilated from the original. So let's stop there. What's he saying? He's saying we use the great Bible unless we saw fit to change it based upon the Hebrew and what? And Greek, okay? So that I trust your loving subjects uh, shall see good cause in your majesty's days to thank God and to rejoice to see this high treasure of his holy word to set out as many as be proved uh, so forth as man's mortal knowledge can attain unto, or as far forth as God hath hitherto revealed, to be faithfully handled in the vulgar tongue. Now watch. Beseeching your highness, that it may have your gracious favor, license, and what? Protection, to be communicated abroad, as well as for that in many churches, that uh, they want their book. So what is Archbishop Parker asking the queen to do in that sentence? He's asking her to, to, to license it, essentially, right? To officially license and sanction the Bishop's Bible 
as the official church, the official Bible of the Anglican Church. So everybody following what, what he's asking there, okay? So we don't really need to read any further. Let's just read the last sentence. I have been bold in the furniture with few words to express the incomparable value of this treasure. So Archbishop Parker is definitely seeking the Queen's license on this Bible, right? For official use in the Anglican Church. The Queen is not going to give it to him, ultimately. So if you look at the next point, despite the Archbishop's request that Elizabeth license the new Bible, official royal sanction would not be forthcoming. That said, the volume was received and endorsed by ecclesiastical authorities, i.e. the bishops of the Anglican Church. So let's stop there for a minute. Does the Queen ever give it her royal license and sanction? No. Do the Anglican bishops give it their ecclesiastical sanction and license? They do. They're going to stand behind this thing and they're going to say, this is sort of our Bible, but the queen is never going to give it royal license and royal authority. Everybody with me so far? Consider the following citations from the pens of Mombert, Brake, and Daniel. So first from Mombert, quote, it is vain to speculate on the reasons for which royal authority was not accorded to the bishop's Bible, which not until 1557 was set forth by authority, i.e. by episcopal authority. So that would be the bishops of the Anglican Church putting it forward with authority, but not the license and authorization of who? The queen. Brake says, next quote, Although the Bishop's Bible was never officially licensed as the authorized Bible, the church and state enthusiastically received it. Clearly superior to the Great Bible, its actual translation fell short of the quality and simplicity of the Geneva translation. It never gained the popular support that they had hoped it would. So that's again, we've already seen this point, right? The Bishop's Bible is going to be the, bishop, the, the, the Bible of the Bishops of the Anglican Church, the Bible of the people is going to remain which one? The Geneva Bible. And then from Daniel, quote, Queen Elizabeth did not do what her archbishop requested and acknowledged the Bishop's Bible as the standard English church text. It never happened. So that means then that you've got basically two Bibles that are, that are competing with each other for acceptance with, amongst English-speaking Christians. You have the Great Bible, which is the Bible of the bishops of the Anglican Church. I'm sorry, you have the Bishop's Bible, which is the Bible of the bishops of the Anglican Church. And then you have the Geneva Bible, which is the Bible of the people. So the, the Bible that the people are reading and possessing in their homes is the Geneva Bible. The Bible they hear read out loud if they go to an Anglican Church service is the Bishop's Bible. So you've got two Bibles there that are competing for acceptance by the people of England. Okay, now before we go any further, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? I think she did that out of, uh, of kind of like politics between the two. Absolutely. I mean, she was smart, really, to keep things that way. I think she did it on purpose, and it, it fits her policy, her religious policy that she adopted. And we'll talk more about that again next week, Ken, when we start looking at the Reims Bible. And what the Queen's, we've talked about it once before when we talked about the Elizabethan context back in lesson, uh, well, lesson, one, lesson 138. But yes, she's trying to walk a middle way between the Anglicans and the Puritans. The Puritans favor the Geneva, the Anglicans are favoring the bishops after the bishops is released. Okay? Recall from lesson 141. <laughs> that Richard Jugg was the Queen's printer when the Bishop's Bible was published in 1568. Prior to its release in 1566, Jugg issued a reprint of Tyndall's New Testament, exhibiting some of the textual changes, particularly in Matthew, that would ultimately end up in the Bishop's Bible. Regarding the connection between Richard Jugg and Archbishop Parker, Charles C. Butterworth states the following in The Literary Lineage of the King James Bible, 1340 to 1611. He says, quote, as long as, Archbishop, as long as Archbishop Parker lived, 
Richard Jug enjoyed what amounted to a monopoly as a printer of Bibles. He brought forth nine or ten editions of the bishop's version in all, some folio, some quarto. Nothing further is heard of Bodley's patent to publish the Geneva version. But when Parker died in 1575, Jug immediately felt the loss of his patron. The new Archbishop Grindel was inclined to be sympathetic towards those who were trying to promote the use of the Geneva Bible. A sort of compromise between these conflicting interests was arranged by the Stationers Company, whereby Jug was allowed the exclusive right to publish Bibles of a certain size, while others were allowed the right to publish them in other sizes. So, here's what you need to get from that. Far and away, what's the most popular Bible amongst the common Englishmen? The Geneva. But the Geneva is not being printed in England. It's being printed overseas on the European continent and imported into England at the time. Now, the Queen's not banning it. She's not, she's not like banning it as an import into the country. But at the time, the only Bible officially being printed on English shores was which Bible? The bishops, at least until the death of Archbishop Parker. So the Geneva Bible, the most popular Bible by far in England at the time, was not actually published on English shores until after Archbishop Matthew Parker died in 1575. Yeah? If, if they were importing it, was it not allowed to be printed in England? There was, it seems... Okay, so that's a, that's a hard question to answer for the following reason, okay? There was no act of parliament or act of the queen that said it could not be. But there seems to have been a deal between Archbishop Parker and this printer Jug that he's only going to print the that he's only going to print the bishop's bible. And even though the Queen had granted a printed, a, the Queen had granted a print patent to Bodley to print the Geneva Bible, a seven-year patent, it never was printed in England until after the death of Archbishop Parker. So Archbishop Parker does seem to have suppressed the printing of the Geneva Bible on English shores during his term, if you will, as the Archbishop. It was being printed overseas in Antwerp and other places and then imported. Nobody was stopping it from being imported, but it wasn't being printed on English shores. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so again, you got to get, is all of this political? Probably. Everything we've seen so far with the English Bible is highly political. Going all the way back to Wycliffe and his, remember the Catholic Church hated Wycliffe? They were so ticked at him, they, they exhumed his dead body, burned his corpse, and sprinkled his ashes in the river. You remember that? That's how mad they were at him for putting the Bible in English. That was Wycliffe. Tyndall was burnt at the stake. Did I say Tyndall? Wycliffe was the guy who was, after he was dead, they exhumed him, burnt his dead body, and sprinkled his ashes in the river. They were so mad at him for putting the Bible in the Middle English. Tyndall, they tied him to the stake and they at least gave him the, the uh, courtesy of slit in his throat before they burned him. But, you know, such is the way of the Inquisition, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to be burned at the stake, I guess I'd rather have my throat slit first. Thank you. Yeah. So recall from Lesson 136 that despite the fact that Queen Elizabeth had... So, Bart, here's your... Okay. Your, your uh, question. Recall from Lesson 136 that despite the fact that Queen Elizabeth had issued a patent to print the Geneva Bible for seven years to John Bodley, the Geneva Bible was not printed on English shores until after the death of Archbishop Parker in 1575. So that means that the Geneva Bible first appears in 1560. It's not printed in England until after the death of Parker in 1575. So for the first 15 years of the existence of the Geneva Bible, it's never printed where? In England. It's never printed in England, even though during that 15-year time period, what's the most popular Bible in England? The Geneva Bible. So that's telling you 
that's being printed elsewhere and then imported during that 15 year time frame. Dr. Daniel offers the following interesting perspective on these details, quote, the list of 15 editions before Parker's death conceals an interesting insight. Though he and, he and the Bishop of London, Grindle, also mentioned above, had recommended that John Bodley's exclusive privilege for printing the Geneva Bible for 12 more years be extended from 1565, even though the bishops were, print, were, were putting out a new Bible for church use on the grounds that uh, diversity is healthy, Parker and Grindle carefully kept a proviso of their approval, in fact, which they withheld. No Geneva Bibles were printed in England in the 10 years until Parker's death in May 1575, when they instantly began being printed again in volume allowing the bishops a clear run at the field. So are these guys politically moving the pieces to give their bishop's Bible a head start as far as acceptance. Okay? Pollard wrote, quote, It is impossible, therefore, to avoid the conviction that to the very end of his life, Parker used his control over the stationer's company to prevent the Geneva version being printed in England, and also to secure for Jug the monopoly of printing the bishop's Bible. It seems certain that the archbishop cared little for providing Bibles for private reading. He saw and met the need of suitable editions for the service of the church, but he did not trust the people with cheap editions of the Bible, and his lack of confidence sealed the fate of the bishop's Bible. Now, obviously you understand, right? If the, if, these, if, if the Geneva Bible is going to be printed on English shores, is it going to be cheaper than importing it? So price-wise, while you could still go buy a Geneva Bible, could you buy a Bishop's Bible cheaper than you could have bought a Geneva Bible? So these guys in the church, these, guys, these, these high bishops in the church, the queen's not doing any of this. They are moving the pieces in such a way so as to stack the deck and give their Bible the advantage as far as printing and price and all the things that you might think about in the market that might uh, impact who's getting a Bible and for how much. Now, this is all stuff that we probably don't ever think about. Right? I mean, if you want a Bible, if you want a King James Bible, you can, first of all, you can go get one for free and put it on your phone and, and not even give it another thought, right? You can do that. I've got, I mean, I've got Blue Letter Bible on my phone. I use it all the time. If I want a Bible, I can go to the store. I can go to the dollar store for crying out loud and from Dollar General buy a King James Bible for like four bucks or something like that, Okay. So there's all these things going on back then that we don't really think about today because they're, they're really of no consequence to us. Um, but they were very impactful on what was going on with the history of the Bible back then. So let's finish this quote then from Daniel. Perhaps this would not have mattered too much for readings in church while everyone had a Geneva at home. But the aim over the next 50 years was for political reasons to oppose Geneva. Even as it grew in force and influence, and eventually kill it outright, the aim was successful. Now I'm going to read this to you from him, even though I don't totally agree with it. The replacement from 1611 of the remarkable, accurate, informative, forward-looking Geneva, even at the time of its greatest growth and power, with the backward-looking, increasingly Latinate, often badly unhelpful King James Version, is one of the tragedies of our culture, the exact reverse of what was being said for so long. One must regret that the King James that one must regret that King James in 1605 gave each member of his panel of re, panels of revisers this bishop's Bible in the second 1572 folio edition uh, with the with small New Testament revisions as the base text. So understand, let's understand what he's saying there, okay? 
He's saying that did they succeed in eventually killing the Geneva Bible? How did they succeed in killing the Geneva Bible? With the King James. That's his read of the situation. So when you read what he says there, it sounds very negative towards the King James, doesn't it? Okay. So we have to, that's his attitude. I don't agree with his attitude about it, but you have to understand, was the Geneva Bible eventually replaced by the King James Bible? Yes. And is the King James Bible, for good or bad, right or wrong, a Bible produced under royal authority at the combined effort of bishops of the Anglican Church and Puritan scholars? It was. And eventually, did it replace the Geneva? It did. So, for good or bad, right or wrong, that's what happened. Next, next point. While I do not share Professor Daniel's negative attitude towards the King James Bible, it is important to note that the Bishop's Bible was the Bible of the Anglican Church, not the common Englishman. Had it not been for Rule 1 given to the King James translators to follow the Bishop's Bible as their base text, it is quite probable that this volume would be remembered as one of the most unpopular Bibles in the history of our language. That said, the Bishop's Bible remains of the utmost importance for our purposes as we seek to understand the making of the King James Bible. Because the King James Bible was ultimately going to be a revision of which Bible? The, the Bishop's Bible. So I was in a conversation, Ernie witnessed it this week, with this gentleman who was just not by, he was upset with me for saying that the King James Bible was a revision of the Bishop's Bible. And he was like, no, 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 it was Tyndall and it was Geneva. And I even, I even provided links to this gentleman to pictures and photographs of a Bishop's Bible with the handwritten notes of the translators in the margin, proving that they are revising the Bishop's Bible as their base text. And he still did not want to listen to what I was saying. So there's a lot of out there in the marketplace of ideas around these things. There's a lot of uh, folklore, I might say, that's just not true. This whole thing is a pot. Now, James, think about it. James comes to power. We've already talked about this. James comes to power. Does James like the Geneva Bible? He does not like the Geneva Bible. Why? Because there are marginal notes in the Geneva Bible that are against the divine right of kings. Does James view himself as a monarch ruling by divine right? So when he, when he puts this out there for there to be a new translation of the text, he is not going to adopt the Geneva as the base text. He's going to adopt the what? The bishops as the base text. Because as the king of England, is he now also head of the Anglican church? You see how that works? So does he get to decide what the base text is going to be? He does. He does. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments about all that before we get to the last point about Coburn? Is that the biggest mistake that the Anglican I think that's the I mean there are there are reading there are some reading differences in some of the readings um, they're both coming from the same Greek I would say the biggest difference is probably the marginal notes that's one of the biggest differences and there are differences in wording in some places too um, some of them are substantive some of them are not if you go to the church's website um, let me show you how to do this. So I'm going to go back to gracelifebiblechurch.com and I'm going to click under Meet the Pastor. And I'm going to scroll down to 2015. It's 2015, Great Lakes Grace Bible Conference. You see this link here that says Collation Comparing Varied English Readings in the Geneva Bishops and King James. If you click that, this is a link to a document that I put together uh, comparing so let me show you so here are some of the major differences right 
So here's Deuteronomy 23, 17. Here I have the Geneva reading. Here I have the bishops reading. And then here I have the King James reading. So there's about, there are some places that I think you could say that the, the differences are substantive. Potentially substantive as far as what the text is teaching. Um, so there are some differences that way between the Geneva and the bishops. So if you want to look, look at more of this, I'd say check out this document. So I've got all of them there for the Old Testament. And I've got, uh, if you scroll down, I've got them in here too for uh, New Testament readings. Okay? So I know you're all going to just go home and first thing you're going to do is going to, I need to look at that. Right? Before dinner. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Let's look at the last point then the impact of Coverdale. In his The History of the English Bible from 1882, Blackford Condon is correct in pointing out that the name Miles Coverdale is conspicuously missing from the list of men who worked on the Bishop's Bible. This is, an, this is important to note given that it was Coverdale's prior work on the Great Bible from 1539-1540 that Archb Archbishop Parker was revising in the 1560s. Condon states the following regarding the matter, quote, During the revising of the Bishop's Bible, there was one, one man, the Venerable Miles Coverdale, who must have been deeply interested in the work, and yet, as far as the records go, he had no share in it. His advanced age is a su uh, sufficient reason for this, since he was now, in 1568, since he is now 1568, he is fully 80 years of age. I think that's say 80 years. 80 years of age and drawing very near to the end of his pilgrimage. Okay, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to put this up just, just for a frame of reference. It's got nothing to do with this, okay? Here's Coverdale. 1535, he makes his whole Bible. He's involved in the revision of the Great Bible in 1539-1540. He's living in Geneva, Switzerland as an exile when the Great Bible is done. And now the Bishop's Bible is done in the 1560s, and they are revising, the bishops of the Anglican Church are revising his work from the Great Bible from 1539, yet Coverdale seems to have had no part in the Bishop's Bible. The reason for that is probably the fact of his age. He's now in his late 70s, early 80s, 80 in the year that the Bishop's Bible was printed. But he's still alive. Coverdale is a fascinating case because he's one of the few guys that actually lives through this whole sweep of history without dying, without being killed. Okay. Since the publication of his complete English Bible in 1535, the ghosts of Coverdale hung over almost every important revision that we have discussed in this class. Only William Tyndall had a greater impact upon the history and fortunes of the English Bible. So Tyndall would be like the number one chief person of importance. Second underneath him would be who? Coverdale. Quote, since 1535, he, speaking of Coverdale, has had to do with almost every important revision of the English scriptures. He was an intimate friend both of Cromwell and Cramer and enjoyed their confidence to the last. In his long life, he witnessed great changes both in church and state. His life spanned the reigns of four English sovereigns, which constitute epochs most important to, and, and interesting to the history of Protestantism and the English Bible. From the beginning of his career, Coverdale was a disciple of the new learning. He was, however, always charitably inclined towards those of the old learning. Though increasingly in, his, in age, he kept abreast with the progress of the Reformation. He was among the Genevan exiles during the fearful reign of Mary. Under Queen Elizabeth, he was a nonconformist. A father among Elizabethan bishops, he was sadly neglected and yet was not without honors. In December 1559, he was called to assist in the consecration of Archbishop Parker. 
In 1563, he was honored with the degree of Doctor of Divinity at the university, by the University of Cambridge, although already a bearer of this honor conferred by the University of, to, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that word. To begin. To begin. So that's a European university. Through the agency of Bishop Grindel, he received the rector of St. Mangus near London Bridge, but, he, but uh, he resigned in 1566. He continued, however, to preach, and the people continued to throng to hear him. Miles Coverdale stood first in his day among the preachers of the word. He stands second only to William Tyndall as a translator. While he was employed frequently in the discharge of important public duties in church and state, yet his life work was that of a translator and a reviser of the Holy Scriptures. Eminent alike for piety and learning, he died in February 1569 at the advanced age of 81 years. Upon the monument enacted, uh, erected to his memory in the parish of St. Mangus in 1837 were inscribed these words. Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings and bring glad tidings of good things. So, Coverdale is a massively important figure in the history of the English Reformation and of the history of the English Bible. Even to his very death, I would say he is more under, he's second under Tyndall as far as translation goes, but you could argue that there was no more popular preacher even until he died at the age of 81, as far as the people wanting to hear him preach. Having survived so much, Religious and political upheaval, he died of old age. Dr. Dan, uh, Donald L. Brake is justified in describing Coverdale as being, quote, politically astute and politically savvy. The following events in the long and storied life of Miles Coverdale was presented in Dr. Brake's A Visual History of the English Bible. So we have, we have the timeline here, okay? So he's born in 1488. In 1514, he enters as an Augustinian monk. So he's, at this point, is he highly Roman Catholic? Okay. Uh, in 1527, he won the favor of Thomas Cromwell. In 1528, he leaves the priesthood for Lutheranism. So he embraces the Protestant Reformation. In 1528, he fled the continent to avoid persecution. In 1529, he, be he uh, began his first exile in Hamburg, perhaps met with Tyndall to assist in the translation of the Pentateuch. In 1534, he began translation, probably with uh, some encouragement from Thomas More and Cromwell. In 1534, Coverdale joined with John Rogers, later translator of the Matthews Bible. He took, in 1534-35, he took refuge in Antwerp and completed the translation of the Coverdale Bible. In 1535, the Coverdale Bible, the first complete Bible in modern English, was printed in Antwerp on October 4. 1537, Coverdale's first printed Bible was officially authorized. Not sure about Brake's use of authorized here, okay, by Henry VIII. 1537, Coverdale was commissioned by Cromwell to begin the preparation of the Great Bible. 1538, Coverdale adopted, or uh, sorry, approved the third edition, Diglot, printed in France, so that was the parallel columns between Latin and English. In 1538, the Counter-Reformation destroyed the presses in printing uh, English Protestant Bibles. In 1539, he fled to France. In 1539, the Great Bible was completed in April. He fled to England, sorry, in 1539. The Act of Six Articles was signed in 1539. If you drop down uh, now look at 1540, he goes to exile again, and he stays in exile all the way until 1547. Then he receives his Doctorate of Divinity from uh, Tübingen University, and then 1546, Coverdale's books are condemned by Bishop Bonner, and several are burned publicly. In 1549, he assisted Erasmus in his paraphrase uh, of the New Testament, Volume 2, 1550, there's a reprint of his great of his Bible, his Coverdale Bible from 1535. 1533, we have the death of Edward VI and the ascension of Mary signals another period of exile. Coverdale was exiled three different times. He leaves England on an exile to escape or religious persecution three different times. 
Um, in 15, 1554, he's released from prison for tax evasion in Denmark. I don't know a lot about what happened there. And if that was a false accusation or if something happened and he didn't pay his taxes. It says he returned to Denmark. When was he in Denmark? He was in Denmark. He was in Denmark when he was do, working out of Antwerp on his Bible. And Antwerp's in, Antwerp's in Belgium. Well, he was in Denmark. Where was he in Denmark? I know he was in Denmark at some point. Hamburg? That's in Germany, right? Yes. Anyway, some other point he was... 1558, he moves to Geneva where he had a minor role in the translation of the Geneva Bible. 1559, he returned back to England. In 1563, he actually contracts the plague and survives. In 1563, sorry. 1563, he's, he receives a Doctor of Divinity degree from Cambridge. And then in 1569, he died on January 20, and he was buried in the chancel at St. Bartholomew, London. The church was torn down in 1840, and Coverdale's remains were moved to St. Mangus Church near London Bridge. And that's where the, if you go there today, that's where you will find the statue uh, erected to the memory of Coverdale that we read the inscription off of earlier in the lesson. Okay, So Coverdale's an important person. He doesn't have anything to do with the Bishop's Bible, but does he loom large over most of these. He knew Tyndall for sure. He does his own Bible. He knew John Rogers. He's responsible for the Great Bible. He was in Geneva during the time that the Geneva Bible was being translated. He's still alive, although seemingly not involved in the Bishop's Project in the 1560s. He's exiled three times. He lives through the reign of four English monarchs. Um, I mean, he, he definitely is an important figure in the history of the English Reformation and the English Bible. So before we get to the conclusion, does anybody have any questions or comments? No? Okay, so conclusion. As things stand right now, there is one more pre-1611 English Bible that requires our attention before we begin discussing the authorized version next fall. And that's the Reims New Testament of 1582. And next Sunday, we're going to begin then looking at the Reims. So we have, a few, we have time, if anybody has a few questions, um, to, to take them at this point. Anybody have any questions or comments or anything they want to ask? The Reims is just the New Testament. It doesn't go any further. So if you, Mike was asking about this earlier. So the New Testament is published in 1582. The Old Testament is published in 1610 from Douai, France. The Reims was done in Reims, France. The Douai was done in, the Old Testament was done in 1610. So most people will refer to it today as the Douai Reims. So the Douai Reims would be both portions of this combined into one book. Now, the Old Testament portion of the Reims was done too late to have had any impact on the King James. Because the Douay comes out in 1610 and the King James is printed in when? 1611. Okay? So the Douay, the Douay Old Testament has no impact on the King James Bible. However, the New Testament does impact some of the readings in the 1611 King James as far as the New Testament goes. Okay? Now, again, Ernie, I see the wheel spinning in your head. That is contrary to the two streams of Bibles idea. Right? Because the two streams of Bibles idea would say this is a Catholic Bible and it is totally evil. Right? It's in the, it's in the corrupt stream of transmission and it's a bad Bible and so therefore, you know, it's relegated <clears throat> to that corrupt stream. The problem is, is that there are cle there's clearly remish vocabulary in the 1611 King James Bible where they clearly made choices to, to use wording that they got from the Reims in some of the readings. 
So again, it's an inconvenient truth possibly for some defenders of the King James, but it's a true statement nonetheless. So we're going to have to spend some time looking at this um, this Reims New Testament. The Reims, uh, the Latin Vulgate was primarily uh, used in creation of the Reims. Yes. And that's where I think people object to, uh, you know, the... So, <clears throat> Mike, I don't know if you remember, but I remember uh, when we were in, like, lessons 92 through 98... And we were talking about the two streams of Bibles model of transmission and how people want, they, they have this dichotomy between the Old Latin and the Vulgate. Right. Remember this? And they have, so the Old Latin is so, the so-called good Bible of the Waddensians and the Vulgate is the evil Bible of the Catholic Church. We talked about this. Mm -hmm. Which is suspect, right? Um... For a lot of reasons, it's not based upon a textual evaluation of readings. It's based upon that Wilkinson guy, that Seventh-day Adventist, Benjamin Wilkinson, who wrote that book in 1930, God, God, uh, Our Authorized Version Vindicated, where he says there are two streams of Bibles, and he says that the Old Latin is the Bible of the Waddensians, and it's the good Bible, and the Vulgate is the evil Bible of the Catholic Church. And he did it because of um, Ellen G. White and the... Seventh-day Adventist spirit of prophecy. Remember we studied that? Mm -hmm. The test coming next week. <laughs> so how many, seriously though, how many of you remember me talking to you about that? You know, I was thinking about that, Ernie. I don't know if you were, if you missed that. You might have missed that. But let me show you what I'm talking about here briefly to, to end this. So there's a set of notes on the church's website where I took all of those lessons on the two streams of Bibles model of transmission and I put them together into one document. Now, in this document, we talked about this old Latin, Latin Vulgate dichotomy. And I just have to find the, the graphic here. There's a meme that circulates quite often on Facebook and social media about the King James and modern versions. I need to keep going here. If you, if you don't remember this stuff, I, I highly recommend that you um, look, look at this. So I'm looking for something specific. Just bear with me, please. Okay, there it is. I just passed it. Okay, so here's what I said back in Lesson 90-something. Lastly, the Catholic Reims New Testament of 1582 is always placed in the stream of corrupt Bibles, <clears throat> along with modern versions, versions such as the NIV, New American Standard, uh, English Standard Version, or ESV at New King James. The following portion of a meme is very popular on Facebook and other social media websites. So here's what it says. It says, almost all modern versions, including the NIV, remove 16 verses from the New Testament. And it lists them out. Okay? Everybody see the list? Mm -hmm. You've probably seen this before. We've talked about some of these before, right? Every single one of these 16 verses that is missing from an NIV or an ESV is in a Reims New Testament. Yeah, oh. It's not as cut and dry. It is not as cut and dry, folks, as people want it to be. All 16 of these verses that are left out of an NIV or an ESV are in the Reims New Testament of 1582. Yet the Reims New Testament is put into the corrupt stream, right? Now, I'm not a Reams advocate. If somebody's watching this or you're sitting here thinking, oh, well, Ross is advocating that we all pick up our Reams. No, I'm not, okay? It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is do we need to be accurate in what we say about the Reams? Would somebody be far better off textually reading a Catholic Reams in terms of the verses that are there or not there than they would an NIV? Hello. 
But yet the reams, according to the two streams model, is holy, evil, bad, and in the, in the, in the bad stream. So like, here's what I said about this. So I downloaded a PDF copy of the Reams New Testament, original Reams New Testament, and check to see if this check to see if the 16 verses listed on the mean above were omitted. My investigation revealed that all 16 verses that were missing from modern versions are present in the Reams New Testament of 1582. Textually, one would be better off reading a Reams New Testament than they would be using a modern version. Yet the reams and modern versions are listed in the same stream of transmission. That's a problem. If you care about facts, and if you care about saying things that are true, that's a problem, which is a reason why we're going to have to talk about the reams starting next time. And again, here's my copy of the reams. This is the PDF that I pulled off of. This is what it looks like. And... Um, I've checked every one of these reference, all 16 of them, and they're all textually in the text. So, yeah, we're going to get to the reams next time. Any other questions? Looks like the reams has notes on marginal notes. So the reams has marginal notes, and we'll talk more about this next, next time. But the reams also has, after every chapter, an extensive list of annotations for chapter one. Now, here's where here's where you got to be careful with the reams, right? And here's why I'm not giving the reams like my full rubber stamp of approval. When you read the explanations, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find the biblical text commented on from a Roman Catholic point of view in these annotations. But as far as the text, the biblical text up here, the numbered verses, all 16 of those verses that are missing from modern versions, they're all in the reams. Is there a theme to those missing verses that they were left out for? No. They were left out by Westcott and Hort in 1881. And so they have been left out since then. That's the whole thing about this, right? That's the whole thing about the two streams. It actually hides from view how bad the modern critical text and modern versions actually are. By creating this false dichotomy and this mishmash jumble of things that isn't the way things actually happen. So, if you don't remember about the two streams and if you want me to email it to you, you can read the thing or you can watch the lessons because they're all on the church's website. All right, we got to quit, though, now at this point because it is 10 o'clock. I appreciate your attention. Next Sunday, we'll start talking about the reams. If you haven't